pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we all know the two things you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table, right? What are those two things? You can tell me. Politics and? <laughs> I'm sorry, I heard something different. Politics and what? Religion, right. You're, you could say religion in this place. I mean, it's a religious place. Um, yes, you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion. And what do family members want to talk to the priest about? All the time. What a day. What a dinner time. Um, one instance that where this happened was very interesting. I was praying over a meal at a family gathering, and I um, prayed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and my one Christian relative was struck by that. Um, I don't know what struck him so much, but he was struck that I didn't speak of the name of Jesus, where many evangelicals might pray in the name of Jesus, which is always acceptable, of course. But he was struck by this language of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I realized that where he went to church, they really didn't talk about the Trinity that much, um, unfortunately. Um, but when I asked about this dynamic of the Trinity, he was bewildered that I would pray this way. And yet what we see about the Trinity, and our focus today being Trinity Sunday, is that the Trinity is a key distinctive doctrine when it comes to to Christian identity and Christian unity. Another family member spoke up, of course, and wanted to validate their Jehovah's Witness background to say that they too belong to the Christian church. And I said, um, I apologize, but let's talk about this for a moment. And as I described the Trinity, which really going through the creed, where all various Christian denominations agree on, by the way, Jehovah's Witnesses can't find a place there. Neither can Mormons either. So, why is the Trinity so important? Why is it so distinctive to Christianity? Now, many of us probably will say, well, yes, of course, I believe in the Trinity, and you check off your little religious boxes and say, yep, believe that, yep, believe that. But it certainly doesn't impact my life because I can't fully understand it. Right? Sometimes that's our kind of knee-jerk reaction to the Trinity. Now we like to use the word mystery when talking about the Trinity, which we think means unexplainable. As if this is a Scooby-Doo mystery to be solved of sorts. But the way mystery is understood in the ancient world was to mean revelation. Yes, it is beyond human comprehension, but revelation nonetheless. In other words, the mystery of the Trinity is how God has revealed himself to us. He is one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. i got to say, one of the best videos on the Trinity that you have to look up when you leave here, yes, you have to, is from Lutheran Satire. Just YouTube Lutheran Satire. And you'll find these two Irishmen learning from St. Patrick all about the Trinity, or the other way around. Anyways, it's a hilarious video and explains everything you need to know about the Trinity. So pack up your things, let's go. I'm kidding. Um, but before unpacking why the Trinity matters, I want to make sure we're all pretty much on the same page with the Trinity. St. Augustine was most helpful with catechizing people with his seven statements about the Trinity. Now while the Trinity points at something beyond our comprehension, the doctrine can be stated in somewhat simple terms too. So I want you just to get your thinking caps on real quick, stay with me, maybe get a pencil and paper out, there's going to be a test afterwards, I'll ask you after the sermon, now what were those seven statements? But hear it out just real quick, alright? Number one, the Father is God. That seems easy enough. Number two, the Son is God. Well, that's really interesting. Number three, the Holy Spirit is God. Seems simple enough, right? 
Now you might think that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are just three different names for the one God. But Augustine's not done. Remember, there's seven. Count them. Number four, the Father's not the Son. Number five, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Number six, the Holy Spirit's not the Father. Now you may conclude, oh, there must be three gods, right? Number seven, of course. Lucky number seven. There's only one God. <laughs> That's how he ends it. Um, what's important to catch about engaging this doctrine is the fact that it is a doctrine. That what Augustine was doing was teaching people about God revealed himself, God revealing himself. So the whole purpose is that it's to be taught and learned. But even more than some inexplicable theory about how God is three in one, it's about how God is one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, the mystery of the Trinity is the revelation of, say it with me, the one God who is what father it's going to be a theme in the, in the sermon so you got to catch up with us okay you'll get there i promise you um and, and so the great surprise of engaging the trinity is that it actually the more you engage it, the more you reflect upon it the more it's in front of you in your worship and in your study of god's word is that it actually brings to light not darkness to our understanding of god and of course, his relation to us and his created order. It brings to light why it actually matters. And it's this, that the same God who created you is the same God who rescued you and is the same God who is with you, even in your darkest hours. First, when we say God, we say one God who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? That God is the creator. And we are his creatures who are wondrously made in his image. In other words, the revelation of the Trinity reveals something about what it means to be human. But I've got to give a word of caution here real quick. Now, we don't try to understand God by trying to understand ourselves. This would make God to be in our image and not the other way around. We understand ourselves when we engage the one God who is... Getting good, getting good. Um, the unity of the Father, Son, and Spirit, who were all present at creation, reveals that God is inherently relational. He didn't make us because he was lonely and needed somebody to love. Um, no, he was within his very being and his very nature is community itself. But not the kind of community where the Father, Son, and Spirit are all housemates in some kind of hilarious sitcom, right? Um, no, we see in the Athanasius Creed a very helpful statement about this unity of the persons. And it's this. And in this trinity, none is afore or after other, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal so that in all things, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. We can also see this expressed in our gospel lesson, where we see John weaving together the persons within the Trinity. Um, and it reveals this relational nature of our God that we worship. And so when he made us, he designed us to long for connection and community because that is his very essence or nature. And so we long for this connection to him, for this communion with him, with our creator, and of course with each other. I'm, I'm convinced that one of the leading epidemics in Western civilization and really all over the world, especially post the pandemic, uh, is without a doubt loneliness and isolation. In a world where we thought we would be more connected through what we intentionally call the World Wide Web, that's WWW, by the way. Some people don't actually know that's what it stands for these days. Um, we found ourselves more alone than ever. It devastates us all the more because it's not the way that God created us. Now, while we're grateful for technology, and I feel like I have to say that because 
of the pandemic and what's going on, and people can watch online, all this great stuff, many people are still trapped in themselves with um, this technology. We find ourselves trapped and isolated, and we don't know what's going on inside. And what we want to say is this is a fracturing of our image of God. And it's a fracturing because it ultimately is because we're out of communion with God himself. That's how we're ultimately fractured. It's the very cry from Isaiah where the presence of God comes into the temple. The very holiness or otherness of God strikes Isaiah to the core and he's completely undone. But he also recognizes that he's within a community of sinfully undone people too. So what does this prophet need? What do we need in response to such a fracturing? The prophet needs, and what we need, is atonement. Atonement. What meets us in our cracked and distorted image of God that needs ultimate restoration and resurrection life will always be the atoning cross of Christ. That the cross is the place where the ultimacy of your despair, heartache, loneliness, and the abundance of your sin was met with justice, mercy, and grace of the one God who is. When the seraphim took a burning coal from the altar, it was the place where the sacrifice before the holiness of God was made. It was the sacrifice of someone else that brought atonement for Isaiah. And so it is for us. Our ultimate need for connection, community, and restoration must always begin with the God who created us, the God who rescued us, and the God who's with us, even now in our darkest hours. That on the sacrificial altar of the cross, the Father pours out His judgment upon the Son. The Son submits to the Father who suffers and dies as the unblemished Lamb. And that their mutual submission of love is bound through the Holy Spirit who pours in this love and promises into our hearts. Our guilt is forever put away. And our sin forever atoned for. Our salvation, our justification, and our restoration are all within the dynamics of the Trinity. Atonement makes possible our belonging to God and therefore our belonging to His church, the body of Christ. The connections of our belonging to God and to the church and where we often communicate this atonement is, of course, through the sacraments of the church. Baptism, Holy Communion. We are baptized under the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our names, our stories, our brokenness and sinfulness, everything about us were brought under that name. This morning, we are presenting four names. Simon, Anna, Maisie, Karis. Your names will be united under the name of the triune God. And a new identity in relationship to God and to the church will be born. In these waters, the promise of new life through the atoning work of Christ is communicated to you and to the rest of us baptized that by such promises we were adopted out of darkness and into His glorious light. Our belongings were shifted. Now while we are given these promises in our one baptism, we always find ourselves time and again forgetting all about them. We need sustenance. We need nourishment. And it's through this holy meal where we receive the gifts of God for the people of God. We receive the once and for all grace again and again where the table is always prepared for us, 
and in receiving the bread and the wine, the one God who is He meets us. He meets us there. He meets us in our lonely, in our disillusioned and wrestling sinful hearts where the word is always welcome home. Welcome. There is an intimacy between God and us when we receive communion. But it's also a meal we share together. We commune with God and with one another. And this is where I want to close. We need each other. We need our physical presence with each other. Specifically what I mean is, Christians need the church. We need the church. The more I engage with the sacraments, the more I am seeing how my Christian faith is only ever realized through the church. Now this sounds outrageous too because Christians, like all human beings, are pretty messed up people. <laughs> but that's the point. That the way of grace-based belonging is not through privatized faith, but with sinful children of God. I don't baptize myself, but I am baptized into the church. We receive communion through ordained clergy in the church because Christ instituted it to us. The sacraments, as much as some of us don't like this word I'm about to say, makes really the church an institution. And for these reasons, it can be hard to say you're a Christian outside of being in the church. I was speaking with a newly married couple, and they asked me my advice with raising children in the Christian faith. And my first response was this, and I actually tell this to every premarital counseling I do with, with married couples. And I say, come to church every Sunday with your children. Come to church every Sunday. Make it to say, that's what we do on Sundays. This is who we are. This is our identity. We go to church on Sundays. Now, I'm not here to make you feel guilty about coming to church, by the way. Um, but what I am here to say is this, that we have a remarkable place here in the historic church for sinners to get together to hear what we always forget, to receive God's wondrous gifts towards us, and to actually rest from all the demands that the world puts on us. We have the remarkable honor of coming together to worship the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We sing, we listen, we pray, we kneel and receive all that God desires to give us because the same God who created us is the same God who rescued us, is the same God who's with us, even in our darkest hours. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.